All right, here's the tone. What you heard was a 440 hertz sine wave, also known as A above middle C. Here's another one. This one was a 415 hertz sine wave, also known as G sharp above middle C. You could quite clearly tell that these two notes had different pitches. Let's try shortening them a little bit. It sounded clear in the beginning, but towards the end, telling the difference was really, really hard. All the notes just felt like pops. Maybe this is just a problem with our ears. Maybe we just can't tell sounds apart when they're really short. Perhaps a computer could pick it up. Turns out that isn't the case. When a computer tries to analyze this waveform, it reports that the tone played has a whole bunch of pitches and frequencies. So what's going on here? Here's the 440 hertz tone that you first heard. The horizontal axis is time. You can see the timestamps up here. And the vertical axis is amplitude, roughly corresponding to the loudness of the wave. The faster a wave vibrates, the higher its pitch. It doesn't actually matter what is vibrating though. It could be the speakers, it could be the molecules in the air. All that matters is that this waveform describes how the thing that vibrates is vibrating. The spectral analyzer picks out the frequencies very clearly, except for right at the beginning and over here at the end. This fuzziness is not a shortcoming of the analyzer. It actually tells you something deeper. If we naively tacked on a sine wave to a flat waveform, it wouldn't just join smoothly. There would be a sharp point right at the beginning where the sine wave started. In the real world, a speaker would need to actually vibrate and move air to produce these sounds. It can't go from being still to immediately moving in no time. It can do it in an exceedingly short amount of time, but not zero time. For that short amount of time, the speaker follows a nice smooth curve as it accelerates to the speed it needs to be moving at. This movement is not a sinusoidal vibration. The analyzer spots this and attempts to give it a frequency. And due to a mathematical result called Fourier analysis, it assigns a whole bunch of frequencies to it at once. For extremely short pulses, a large fraction of the pulse is spent smoothing out the boundaries of each note. The analyzer sees more and more of these frequencies and can't pick out a clear pitch anymore. Our ear and our brain is also doing the same thing, which is why we hear a pop. Okay, what if we switch between a 440 hertz tone and a 415 hertz tone, but we do our best to not be jerky or discontinuous? What if we rapidly alternated between the two tones and blended them together as best as we can? We can try that. Notice how we still hear other pitches. It simply is not possible to change from one pure tone to another pure tone without going through some mix of frequencies in the middle. Any smart blending we do still leaves other frequencies that we can hear. The bottom line is, the shorter or narrower a wave is, the more impure it is. That's why drums with very short notes just sound like they don't have a particular pitch, and why violins or guitars with long held notes sound like they do. You also see this effect when you listen to a scratched music CD or a corrupt music file. A corrupt file contains extremely short bursts of random data which your speaker tries to faithfully render as short notes, but instead produces a glitch or a screech. Okay, so what does all this have to do with quantum physics? In quantum physics, we model all matter and energy as waves of some form or the other. Electrons, protons, neutrons, light, everything we know is a wave of some kind. But so is sound. And by studying sound waves, we gain an insight into why quantum mechanical waves behave the way they do. Here's an electron wave. The horizontal axis here is position in space. The vertical axis is again an amplitude, which roughly corresponds to how likely it is that we would find an electron at any given position. An electron wave has the same sort of restriction as regular sound waves. It can't have sharp jerks or jumps. Physicists would call this continuity or differentiability. If you wanted to squeeze an electron into a very small space, you would have to squeeze the wave to fit into that space. But from what we learned about sound waves, we know that if you squeezed a wave too tightly, it no longer remains pure. It's a little bit weird to think about spatial frequency of a wave, because this is a wave of position and not of time. But a wave is a wave, regardless of how you label the axes. The wonderful proposition that quantum physics makes is that the frequency, or the pitch of this electron if you want to think about it that way, determines the electron speed. A tightly squeezed electron wave 
is highly impure. It has lots and lots of other spatial frequencies. This would imply that its speed is more uncertain. And this is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in a nutshell. No mention of observers, no experiments, no spooky cats or jumping particles. It's a result that follows from the properties of waves in general. You simply cannot refine the speed and position of a particle beyond a certain point. Not because the particles are weird magic, but because particles behave just like waves at certain length scales.